Okay, so uh, just some notes on the homework. <clears throat> of course, it was due today, and I usually, maybe like you, kind of look at the homework solutions sort of the day before it's due, and then I started writing some more code that may be helpful. I sent a message out on the, our class mail list. So there's a, a little lab, parse tree and morph plotting. Some routines that help a little bit show you how to use sage plotting. Um, this one produces a binary tree. Um, you don't have to rewrite that function so much as, well, maybe you want to change some things, but you just allocate a tree using the sage digraph function. Think of this mostly as boilerplate. Um, um, I, I did, this is um, the positions of the tree nodes, so it looks a little more nicely laid out. But again, you don't have to worry about that. This function calculates all of it. And then basically, uh, once you've allocated the tree, you just pass in the digraph, the depth, and then this kind of auxiliary array, which is the node positions. Um, uh, then you can set up how it gets plotted, which, which uh, tree node is the root, number zero. I pass in the positions for all the nodes. The orientation, I don't know, my, although we call it a tree, often trees go down, you should call it roots. And there are other things you can change here, how you color, whatnot. Um, and then finally you show it. That's the graphic command to put it up on the screen. And then you get something like this. And you can change the size of it with this last. You can change those X uh, width and height if you want. So there you go, labeled edges. I still am having some font problem with my browser, so I use exclamation instead of vertical bar, so symbol probability. It's one of those obscure things somewhere deep down inside my defaults. So there you go. Kind of helps. Do you get a dash with the vertical bar? Yeah. I don't know if it's just the browser or if it's, you can say. Are you getting that too? I get it. Yeah. Firefox. Typical font things. Oh, yeah. I'm using Firefox yeah. too, so I. I get it in Chrome. Dash? So, new notation, exclamation, means conditioned on it. It's a little more dramatic, so why not? <laughs> and then, um, then, then maybe it kind of more interesting than, than doing a full binary tree. Uh, that's just kind of helpful for thinking. I made a function uh, where you can pass in a tree and a word. So you can just put in words, and it'll put the path in, just like I was kind of describing last Tuesday, um, and then build up a tree. So, so, that, so this function, same overall boilerplate, you have to allocate the directed graph from Sage, set up this, this dictionary or array, but that says all boilerplate. You can set depth, and then I just pass in here the tree, the position thing, and the depth I want, and then the depth has to agree with the word length. And it just goes through and allocates tree nodes and edges incrementally. So um, then you plot it basically using the same plot command as the previous thing. It's not really any different. So, and in this case, what I did is I, right, so that's uh, length four binary strings, there would be 16 of them, and I just pruned out the ones that had consecutive zeros, emulating what the word distribution would be like for the golden mean process, so. And then lo and behold, you get this guy. In fact, I guess I should make this smaller. Uh, well, um, yeah, you get this guy here. So you can see the, various morphs and so on. It'll be clear on your display. This is a bit cramped because of the video projector. Anyway, so, so that's that. Uh, feel free to modify things. Um, I did, just as a reminder, in fact, the way I programmed all this up, in Sage, if, you, if there's some function you're interested in, like the plotting function, right? so I, I allocated some object, directed graph, and then in object-oriented programming, every object has a whole list of functions, so-called methods, that operate on that data structure. So there's one that Sage attaches to a digraph called plot. You just put a question mark here, then execute that code cell, and then boom, you get tons of documentation. Sage and Python see pretty well documented. And it goes through all the different keyword and positional uh, parameters in, gives you, in the documentation, gives you example code. So of course, the way we do coding these days is by example, by stealing stuff and adapting. So. And then same thing down here for uh, the digraph. What's a digraph? When? What can I do to it? Explains all of that. So Sage is very handy that way. You can query the documentation right as you're working. So I was just kind of going back and forth, steal some of the example code, modify, modify, change, um, so on. And then they have lots of example code. And of course, there are whole you know, web pages that are more systematic <coughs> that document you know, 
Python, 2.7, Sage, Matplotlib, and all that sort of thing. So anyway, there you go. There's certainly many more little helper routines one could write for this, uh, but hopefully this will get you started. And there is a question on the homework 12 assigned today that I give you a word distribution and you're supposed to figure out what it is and interpret it. So that's part of the theme today. I mean, we've done all this essentially heavy lifting, both sort of formally and algorithmically. And now the, we're sort of embarking on a series of lectures that um, maybe emphasize what it means to discover a new property. So I'll be talking about the day. Maybe it's, you know, it's, it'll be kind of snippets, different observations. Um, at the end of Thursday, we're going to end up with yet another puzzle, hopefully counterintuitive but interesting, um, about time asymmetry. That's going to lead us to generalize yet again. So next week, there'll be a, a, a sort of a new concept of state, generalized notion of causal states we'll use, so-called mixed states. But first, th this week is kind of, oh, what, what did we learn? What did we learn? So, and of course, one of the first things is now that we've extracted this representation, or the lingo is the presentation of a process from the behaviors, um, there's some questions about what does it allow us to me measure. So that's what I want to talk about today um, that gives us uh, a way to make some connections with all the information theory that we were doing. And it's not like we haven't talked about this before, um, um, but now the question today is interpretation and trying to draw some consequences after doing all this work in the previous weeks. So from the information theory, or at least how we adapted information theory to complex processes, we had this list of informational measures, right? all starting from Shannon's notion of uh, surprise and uh, sort of the, the canonical measure is how random a process is, how unpredictable, the entropy rate. But then if you remember, we had this way of looking at the block entropies and basically concocting through a systematic way of taking discrete word length derivatives of coming up with other information measures um, that, uh, right, so we had this geometric interpretation and we went from block entropy to the entropy rate and this was like a slope of the block entropy. It's the growth rate geometrically of the block entropy. <coughs> and then we look at sufficiently long blocks and we actually pull out the intrinsic randomness of a process. Uh, but then we also had the predictability gain and so on and then after taking derivatives we looked at the constants of integration as we came back down the hierarchy. Ran into this excess entropy, which had this very nice expression in terms of the mutual information between the past and future. How much information does the past share with the future? Or since it's a mutual information and that statistic is symmetric, it's also the amount of information the future has about the past. Um, we have the total predictability or some generalized measure of redundancy. How much of the raw measurement is truly randomness and how much of it is sort of hidden structure sort of, you know, pretending to be uh, surprised, but in fact, if you do the right kind of thing, you'll see it's something you can compress out. And then we also had uh, the transient information, which led us to think about how an observer makes measurements and comes to know the internal state of a process. <coughs> so, so this was all in terms of the information theory and block entropies and that entropy hierarchy. So there's a question putting last quarter in the context of the last three weeks, how are these related to the, for example, the statistical complexity? Um, and maybe a practical question is, can we estimate these things if we have the epsilon machine? How can we calculate them? Um, and this is gonna lead us to some curious uh, observations. We will come back and answer both of these questions but it's actually going to take a remarkably long period of time, but hopefully along the way there are interesting observations about what it means to be a complex process, new, new things we discover about them. Okay, but let's start at, at, at the top with more or less the simplest sort of this unifying theme of how random a process is, right? So we have the original definition of the entropy rate given the 
description of the process in terms of sequences and their probabilities. I'm just being kind of formal here. We could define that in terms of the limit of the block entropy divided by L. So this is like the information channel, information per symbol. Um, we had other ways of thinking about that as looking at enough history and looking at the uncertainty in the next symbol based on infinite pasts. Um, and uh, I did mention, but we'll talk about this a little bit more, you can also get this directly from the Epsilon machine. So the entropy of the process is going to be the entropy using the causal states or Epsilon machine. And we have this explicit solution we're going to use that, of course, was due to, we can use this due to unifilarity. In fact, that's one of the things I want to talk about, what happens if we have other models of, the, of, a, of a given process that aren't unifilar. But anyway, so the entropy rate given the epsilon machine is yet again this state average, now causal state averaged, branching uncertainty. So we just go to each state. We've calculated the uh, probability of the causal states. If there are any transient states, those will have zero probability asymptotically. So this is really just going to be positive over the recurrent states. You go to each state, and we look at how uncertain we are in the observing the next symbol. Well, since it's unifilar, that's equivalent to uncertainty in going to the next state. Right? So, so we can use this formula uh, because, as we proved last Thursday, the epsilon machine is unifilar. So this is one of the key benefits of using the epsilon machine. We have this closed form expression for the entropy rate. In fact, I think I've said before that kind of the kind of boils down to um, we basically have to use the epsilon machine to calculate the entropy rate um, simply because it's it's unifilar. There might be other presentations like the prescient rival models. They're also classes that are unifilar, um, we can use those too, but the epsilon machine can also. So again, right, so unifilar means that there's this mapping between the measured sequences and the internal state paths. But basically one-to-one -one correspondence between observed sequences and internal state paths that allow you to, to do this. Because really what you're measuring here is we're using the internal states and we're using the state-to-state -state branching uncertainty. Just like this is really, this formula is really just a modification of the entropy rate for a Markov chain that comes right out of Cover and Thomas, right out of Shannon. So we can adapt that to a hidden process and we get this expression for it. <coughs> so, so now I want to expand a little bit on this, this issue of, of why we need unifilarity. And a nice way to do that is to take one of our workhorse examples, the simple non-unifilar source, as an, another, uh, as a presentation of a process. So, well, imagine that we have a process generated by this mechanism. So it has two internal states. The states branch to each other with fair probabilities. So at least the internal state sequence is a fair coin over AB. But then what we see are given by the 0, 1 symbol labels. So um, if I'm in B, I will see a 0 with probably half and go to A. Right? We talked before when, uh, about uh, this property. If I give you the model and I tell you you've seen a 0, you immediately know what the internal state is, or an A. And sort of like the golden mean process, I know if I'm in A, I'm going to see a 1. So this is a no consecutive zeros process. Um, but after having seen a zero and being absolutely certain about what internal state I'm in, as soon as I see a one, my internal state uncertainty is, is almost perfect. I'm in state A with probability half or in state B with probability half. I suddenly have lost this. So the observer has become unsynchronized to the states of this particular non unifilar presentation. If that was the internal mechanism, then I wouldn't know what state I'm in until I saw another zero. Well, now, if, if I see more and more ones, this initial 50-50 uncertainty I had over the states, more the probability moves over here. So actually, after every successive one I've seen, my expectation of the state distribution changes a little bit. So for, to do optimal prediction, I have to track 
the internal state distribution over these column non-unifilar states. Okay, so that's, that's the puzzle there. Still, simple model. Um, so how are we going to calculate the entropy rate of this? Non-unifilar. So there's some process we have. And then I can tell you, uh, oh, here, this is the mechanism. Can I use this, you know, knowledge that the output alphabet's binary and I have these symbol labeled transition matrices, can I use that knowledge to calculate the entropy rate? And it turns out to be remarkably more complicated. So what I want to talk about are three different methods, none of which actually work, but they're reasonable first approaches. And I can point you to papers in the literature that use these methods. So this isn't my just drawing out straw men to make a point, although it's kind of that. Um, so, um, so let's see. First thing is, oh, we could just look at the internal Markov chain, like I said. Okay, but that's a fair coin over A's and B's. <coughs> okay, and that would be the Markov chain transition matrix. And we have, you know, now just by observation, calculate the left eigenvector, the asymptotic state probabilities. And I can, you know, just sort of naively just take the formula I put up there for a Markov chain now. And I just look at the state average, state to state transition uncertainty. Well, so in each state, I'm in each state with probably a half, and I'm uncertain whether I'm going to be an A or B with 50-50, so my state uncertainty on the transition is, is one bit, and I'm in B with uh, probably a half, and then I see one bit of uncertainty. So I get a half and a half, so I get one bit per symbol output uncertainty. So that should strike you as a pretty bad approximation. Why? Because I know that there's a restriction in the observed sequence. That's not captured here. All sequences can occur. It's basically a fair coin. Well, OK, so method B would say, well, okay, it's pretty clear from just looking at the original two-state non-unifilar presentation that there, is, there are some restrictions in the observed sequences. I don't see consecutive zero. So I can write down a Markov chain that describes that restriction and then calculate its entropy rate, okay? So this is the golden mean again. If I see a zero, I must see a one. And then when I'm in one, I have equal branching to go either, produce either a one or a zero. So we've done this ad nauseum. We know that this state occurs to probably two thirds, this state with probably one third. So that means two thirds of the time I'm here and I have one bit of transition uncertainty. One third of the time I'm here, but I know exactly where I'm going, so there's no uncertainty in the future. So two thirds of the time I have one bit of uncertainty, so that's the entropy rate. So maybe that's good. Description of this original simple non unifilar source. Um, we're just sort of taking into account one restriction. Um, we're not, for example, tracking how after we've seen a zero and then see one one, two ones, three ones, how our guess at the internal state probability is changing. I was kind of throwing all that away, so we assume this is just an approximation. But it's certainly better than the fair coin of the internal state process. Um, and it's sort of silly, right? But what we're saying is we sort of use this first approximation. I'm putting this in quotes because it's basically not the entropy rate. <coughs> um, that was this was the fair coin. That's much, much larger than uh, uh, the entropy rate of the golden mean process approximation. But that doesn't make any sense because the entropy of a distribution is always greater than the entropy of the support. Right? So I mean, always less than the entropy of the support. Right? So the support here was just looking at the sequence. Uh, sequence is produced by restricting no consecutive zeros. And then that's contrasted with this other way we're trying to look at the internal state distribution. That was one bit. You can't have a process that has more entropy in the distribution than the entropy over the support, right? There's a bound here, right? When, when, when the support has uniform probability, then the entropy of the distribution, the Shannon entropy of the distribution is the entropy of the uniform distribution. But it's only in that case, and typically less than. So, so, so if we use this, the direct use of the simple non unifilar presentation, that two state model, the internal um, state transition, it gives us an over overestimate the entropy rate. We can maybe kind of argue that this other way of taking into account no consecutive zeros, calculating the entropy rate of the source, of the support, sorry, um, that was better, but is that an upper or lower bound? It's actually kind of tricky. It uh, uh, depends. Um, so 
Um, yeah, we have all this internal state information that's being presented, but that's much more than in the observed process. So how are we going to do this? Calculate, I mean, we, <laughs> I, I give you the matrices, just happens to be non-unifeeler. Um, so we can also look at uh, kind of a direct application of this uh, entropy rate formula for hidden processes, right? So here's that S SNS non-unifeeler presentation again. And we go around to each state, again, they're probably a half. And we look not at the state-to-state -state branching uncertainty, but the uncertainty in the symbols. Okay, well, so. So if we're in, st we're in state A half the time, the uncertainty in the symbols at the next time step, well, we know we're gonna see a one. So there's no uncertainty in the symbols. I'm predicting a one, I will be accurate. And then over here in B, I'm here half the time. Um, and then I see either a one or a zero with fair coin flip. So half the time I see one bit of uncertainty, so that leads to, on average, half a bit per symbol. So here's yet another number, <laughs> considerably lower than the golden mean estimate. Um, so uh, the whole thing is just terribly problematic. Um, I guess as long as we, we're honest with ourselves and saying we're doing approximations, what I'm talking about is okay. But basically, every one of these methods, A, B, and C, is wrong. Of course, and the question is, how do you do it right? <laughs> but the lesson is uh, all the kind of naive first cut approximations. Actually, they're really bad approximations, each for their own reason. But you just cannot use non-unifeeler presentations to calculate the entropy rate. So someone just gives you a hidden Markov model and says that they're calculating the entropy rate. They know how random the process is. I would question them pointedly to find out how they did it. The main point is you need the epsilon machine. You need at least a, a unifeeler presentation so that when you use these formulas that are basically calculating the entropy rate of the internal state process, that that maps through the state paths onto observed symbols in a one-to-one -one way. And then the property of the observed process will be measured properly. So it turns out that, and we'll get into this later on, but what I'm doing here is trying to make some obvious connections back to the information theory, answer simple questions that we have the epsilon machine. Um, and uh, it's going to lead us to some um, asking for some new techniques. The actual answer is about 0.68 bits, which is pretty close to that two thirds. So, but that just turns out to be a fluke, that the golden mean the entropy of the golden mean support sequences is close to this, but it's not actually correct. And we can, we'll actually learn how to calculate this in closed form to arbitrary accuracy. So, so. Now, now, kind of the other curious lesson here is um, even if we want to estimate how random a process is, what the lesson here is, depending upon what part of its structure we look at, we can get different answers. In other words, to, to estimate how something random is, you have to know how it's structured. Which, maybe said out of context, is intuitive. In fa but in fact, there has been a, a huge amount of work in, say, nonlinear dynamics and statistical physics that only focus on ways of measuring randomness without talking about whether they have the right structured model, ignoring properties like unifilarity. And so this is just a, mostly sort of a cautionary note. We'll get to do it right, but um, so it's, it's problematic, problematic. Um, just to kind of hint, what we're going to do is for this simple non-unifilar source, we actually end up with a countable infinity of causal states. But we can still work with those. I'll show you how to calculate from infinite matrices, um, the state average transition uncertainty. So, but we'll get there. I have to introduce a few more things. Okay, so we have the sort of size of the epsilon machine, right? The statistical complexity. We know how to calculate the asymptotic causal state probability distribution, and we just, the amount of Shannon information in that distribution is the statistical complexity. And like we talked about before, as we were developing things, it's sort of like the size of the model, right? If the causal states were uniformly probable, then this would just be the log of the number of states, right? P log P goes to just log of the number of events when the distribution is uniform. 
And it's, you know, I guess just overtly, it's the Shannon information that causal states. In other words, a process is rattling around and I say, oh, it's in state D, you go, oh, I'm surprised, right? You're trying to predict the process, this would be your average uncertainty. But there are other ways of thinking about this. Um, um, in particular, and, and this is maybe a semantically subtle sort of point, uh, but in the context of the difficulty we had of coming up with the right entropy estimate, maybe it's not um, subtle at all. I mean, we're interested in figuring out a property of the process out there in the world. Um, and the claim is that when we use the epsilon machine, the properties that we, me we, that we measure of it, in particular the, st the statistical complexity, is a property of the process. Not some approximation, not, not. So, um, so the way we're going to think about this is that the statistical complexity, in addition to this more um, mechanistic view, size of the size of the epsilon machine, there's a number of causal states in a process. We'll, we'll talk about how this is really a measure of the amount of historical information in a process. At every moment in time, there's some amount of past that is remembered by the process. Uh, the loci of that storage, I'm claiming, are the causal states. That should be somewhat straightforward because that's how we constructed them. We grouped the histories together that led to equal predictions. Now, a little more uh, 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 subtle thing, but we'll, we'll come to this at the end of the lecture, is um, this number is the amount of structure in a process. Now that's a little bit new, but if you, you sort of think back to the introductory lecture this quarter and also in, in the winter, I was sort of contrasting how in physics we have measures of disorder, measures of randomness, thermodynamic entropy, temperature, we have all these things, um, um, but there's not a similar systematic way of measuring how structured. I can say this is hotter than that, this process or system has more entropy than that, degrees of disorder, but how is, is, you know, is, is, a, is a chaotic pendulum more or less structured than my laptop? Well, I have a guess, but um, how would you actually measure that? So this is the first kind of big claim, namely that using the statistical complexity, we can start to compare processes on a new axis. Certainly we can compare them to relative randomness, we have the entropy rate, but now there's a new axis, how structured they are, how actually a quantitative measure of how structured something is. So I want to unpack that um, a little bit. I mean, what we mean by structure, organization, regularity, we have a lot of, uh, you know, historical baggage, maybe uh, language uh, history built into what we think that means. And so by having this explicit representation, we can start to explore some, uh, some of those meanings. Um, okay. Um, Right, so one of the things, one of the measures we used a lot in information, in the information theory, sort of the newest thing was this excess entropy. And if you remember that we had these three different definitions for processes, right? One was this, uh, we compared the block entropy of our process to a memoryless process that had the same entropy rate. Block entropy, this curve was the distance between those. Uh, we had this convergence definition. We looked at the L length approximate of the entropy rate and how that converged to the true value and kind of summed up those components. That's this and then, you know, again, the most intuitive one was this mutual information between past and future. Well, and we'd like to think if you believe the claim, for example, that the epsilon machine is this minimal sufficient statistic and you can calculate anything from it for a process, we should be able to get this guy. Well, that's a remarkably subtle question took almost 15 years to figure out, but I'll give you the answer in less than 15 years. So, so how, how to get this, simple thing, how do I get this excess entry? Past future mutual information. I have the epsilon machine, it generates the process, so there's gotta be some connection here, so how, how do we do that? Now, uh, there's some particular cases, and we went through those way back in, in when we were talking about information theory and just talking about the statistical complexity, but now let's compare that, I mean, sorry, the excess entropy, I'll compare that to the statistical complexity. But the punchline is gonna be other than these, these, these special cases where we know the relationship between excess entropy and statistical complexity, past future mutual information compared to internal stored state information, uh, we have to actually introduce a lot more um, some more techniques. Okay, so if you remember when we went through this before, 
for the excess uh, entropy for, we argued that all independent identically distributed processes had zero excess entropy. Well, if you go through the cases, in fact, you can maybe almost do this in your head now, having done the, the homeworks, all IID processes generate some kind of full binary tree with one kind of morph. There's actually just one state. And since we're always in one causal state, the uncert state uncertainty, the state information is zero. So for all IID processes, these two quantities are the same and zero. Memoryless. Okay. Uh, the other simple uh, case we talked about were just periodic processes, right? So we argued that the excess entropy was log of the period and said, well, what kind of information is this? Well, this is the phase information. And if I ignore transient causal states, you can sort of imagine if I have some period P process that the architecture of the recurrent causal states is just going to be some big chain and there'll be P of those. And again, now we have this explicit representation of what was the phase information. It's the causal state you're in. So we have P of those. Uniform probability, so log of equally likely P events is just log of P. So again, so for periodic processes, IID process, these, these completely predictable and completely unpredictable, the, the two extremes we talked about, these two quantities are the same. St stored information, the state information, the same thing as this past future mutual information. Um, now, uh, the kind of an early class that sort of hinted that things are a little more subtle um, is when we look at uh, what I call spin chains. So these are our block Markov process. We lay down blocks of words of length R independently from a distribution. And then you can show that the, the uh, excess entropy is the sort of block entropy, but minus this funny term, the range, the size of the block times the entropy rate of the process. So now, th there's actually, there's a little subtlety here. It's not quite an R-block process. These actually have to be specified by Hamiltonian and described by transfer matrices. But, uh, but what I want to point out is that, at least in that simple case, we could write down a relationship between the state information and the excess entropy. So notice that, again, it's the range. If it was a spin system, I keep saying spin, it's you have spin coupling, and there's a certain range of coupling between the spins. It could be nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor coupling. That's R. So we have the state information. Now it's discounted by this range of coupling and the entropy rate, kind of the, the uncertainty per spin. So here I'm just explaining what the, the, the formula means without telling you why it's the case. We'll come back to that, but it's a little bit odd. But, I, but just to contrast. Um, up here they were equal. Down here there's obviously a non-trivial relationship between these things. And it was at least, I don't know what, eight years? I didn't know what this, I, I could calculate this. I, could calc I, th I didn't know what this meant. Why was, I, why was I discounting the state information by the randomness? Very strange. Also the other thing, it's pretty clear here as long as I have, you know, stochastic process entropy rates a little bit, or a lot positive, that, that's some integer, that the excess entropy is less than the state information. So that a process can have some state information, but not all of that appears in the observations. Okay. And typically, we have this. I should say for hidden Markov chains. For, for general, finitely specified hidden Markov models, unifeeler and ununifeeler. The statistical complexity is an upper bound on the excess entropy. State information is an upper bound on the mutual information that you see in the observations. Well, how is that the case? How can we understand that? Well, we actually have enough, and the derivation isn't too bad. So let me convince you of this rather general, basically for any process, the claim is that this is true. That Basically, in the best case, what you're observing reflects the internal state information. Typically not. Information is getting thrown away. Okay. So, uh, so here's the just few line uh, 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 sketch of the proof. So, so remember that the excess entropy is the mutual information between the future and the past. And we can do our little um, information identities. Again, with a caveat. So again, the caveat is, okay, so I'm going to unpack this. Turns out this term is fine, even though the arguments are infinite numbers of random variables. 
when I unpack it this way, so I'm going to pull out the future. So I have the uh, Shannon uncertainty of the future minus the uncertainty of the future given the past. That's just using the mutual information identity. Right? Now, this, <laughs> this is very problematic, but I'm just going to give the sketch of the proof. I should really have finite futures here because then I have a countable number of objects and this number doesn't diverge. So there's some odd thing going on here. This, it turns out, mathematically is well defined, even though we have infinite chains of random variables. This is very problematic because I'm actually subtracting off two, potentially two infinities. Okay, well, let's just put that caveat aside for now. The overall proof, when you unpack it, you put your finite lengths and take limits at the ends, shows that this is a little bit okay, but just as a proof sketch, you really have to do the stuff right. So uh, anyway, okay, so, so this first step is I just take, apply my information identity, uncertainty of the future minus the uncertainty of the future given the past. Okay, but we know that for this term here, for example, that I can either use the pasts or the causal states that they lead me to. Those are equivalent, right? In fact, we use this move a lot in the proofs of the uh, optimalities of the epsilon machines. In other words, the, the causal states are proxies for the past, or vice versa. And they're sort of just as good, right? They shield. Either I see a particular past or I tell you you're in state F. Same information. So this uncertainty in the future is the same whether I'm looking at the past or the causal state associated with it. So I can just substitute that in here. So uncertainty in the future minus the uncertainty in the future given the causal states. Oh, but that's a mutual information. So I pack it back up again. So now this is the mutual information between the causal states in the future. Fine. And we know, well, I can either unpack it again and argue that now I choose to pull out the, the uncertainty over the causal states minus the uncertainty of causal states given the future. It's slightly odd. Uh, and because it's a positive number, I know that, that this line is uh, upper bounded by just this first term, the entropy over the causal states, but that's the statistical complexity. So here we have our inequality that says that statistical state information is greater than or equal to the excess entropy. Well, th this is kind of strange quantity here. I, I could also just argue, if you remember one of the um, inequalities of the mutual information, the mutual information is always less than the entropy of either one, vari one variable or the uncertainty, uh, the Shannon entropy of the other variable. So we come down to this in any case. But, but this is, this depends. We just use a simple property of this that it's a positive number and subtract it off to get the inequality. Or, you know, if you like to meditate on troubling things, this is bizarre. We're talking, what does this mean? It's, I have a future and then I'm uncertain as to what the present causal state is. This is actually going to haunt us for the next three lectures or two lectures. This kind of thing. For now, all we need is this bound. It's a positive number. Who cares what it means? And we get this inequality. But it's sort of controlling, oddly enough, I mean, I'm kind of dismissing it, but it's controlling the difference between the internal state information and how much mutual information we can see in the observed sequences. So it's kind of important. In fact, it's absolutely critical to figure out what that means, although initially it's kind of odd. We're sort of retrodicting from the future what the current causal state is. So. <coughs> um, well, that was a bound um, um, that the uh, excess entropy is bounded above by the st state information, the statistical complexity. I gave these other cases where E and C mu are the same and wrote down another case uh, where they're actually not equal, that spin case. Um, but it turns out our friend the even process um, actually is, a, is another case where it's neither IID nor, nor periodic, obviously but the excess entropy and the statistical complexity are the same. Now, I have to, we have to in, give you some new techniques so you can calculate this, but just a little heads up. So we have other cases besides the, the extreme of periodic processes in IID where that bound that I just derived is saturated, which means that funny term I was just whining about for the even process is zero. I can, I can, I can, I can take the futures and say what causal state I'm in in the even process? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Okay. So, but this, this leaves open a question. So I've just given you a bunch of examples. Go well, classes where we know what the facts of the matter are. Non-trivial example were the spin chains, but now even the even process, uh, we have the, the bound now saturated. So that's, it's just very puzzling. So we need, there's obviously something else going on here. Much deeper questions. Um, kind of 
Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, so is there a corollary then to causal states, like effective states, states that represent, you know, if you know the, all the future, all the futures that have the same past would be the same effective state equivalence class kind of thing? Yes, that's exactly where we're going to go. Oh, cool. So I've been talking about, you know, a past and then, you know, the entropy rates, the uncertainty of the next symbol. Well, that's prediction. What this is actually hinting at is we have to understand what retrodiction is. Looking at the past and asking, well, what next symbol or the previous symbol or the, the current state? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have to get much more comfortable with that. So, um, to answer the question. But let's just kind of drill down a little bit more on this comparison between sort of the, the state information that's stored internally in a, in, a, in a hidden process and what we can see informationally in the observed sequences via the mutual information. So this kind of the extreme interpretation of this, this CMU bound on E is what I call the cryptographic limit. So there are examples, whole families of processes, infinite numbers of processes, where at least the observed information, mutual information, is arbitrarily close to zero, and the internal state information is arbitrarily big. So you might remember last quarter I kept talking about partly by way of trying to explain what this past future mutual information was or what E was is some kind of memory. I probably even slipped and said the stored information. It ain't the case. That, so I usually said apparent stored information. It's what you get in the observed symbols. So this cryptographic limit, this class of processes that satisfy this, there's an arbitrary distance between what you observe in your measurements and how the process is structured internally. So, so now, now the, the state information is still in the sequences, right? I'm not saying equal to zero. If E was equal to zero, it would be an IID process, and as an IID process, it would have one causal state and CMU equal to zero. So think of this, now this is epsilon small, but still not zero. So the state information is still in the sequences, oddly enough. It's just not immediately apparent. You have to do a lot of work to pull it out. So, so, and the reason I call this a cryptographic limit, it's very similar. So, so sort of as the, you know, analyst or the scientist, we're trying to figure out, you know, nature's hidden secrets. Well, in this case, more prosaically, what are the internal, what's the internal state structure and stored information? Sort of similar to, to cryptography, right? If you have some plain text that you want to transmit to across the country, you scramble it all up so that at least to ob all observers, the symbols you transmit look like randomness. In fact, the closer that text looks to having ex zero excess entropy or zero CMU, the better. The harder to, for the, the, the crypt analyst back at the NSA to, to um, figure out what the actual message was. But you're not sending a random sequence, right? I mean, the goal is that, that the receiver that gets the message decrypted. So there has to still be some way of, some little bit of information in the sequence that it's, it's, it can still be unpacked. So that's the sort of analog up here. Even though at the excess entropy is very, very small, close to zero, there's still the internal state information somewhere hidden in sequences. And you would still write down the call state equivalence relation and go through this. It just could be quite hard. So here's maybe more visually, here's one class that's processes that satisfy this cryptographic limit. I call them the almost IID processes. And what you should imagine here is, uh, well, here's a state diagram, has eight states. Uh, the way I built this up, though, was I started with the fair coin, single state model of fair coin, then I split it, so I had two states with equal transition probabilities, and I split each of those to have four states, and I split each of those again. They, but they all had uniform transition probabilities which means if I actually apply the equivalence relation, they'd all collapse back down to a single state again, and I would say CMU is equal to zero. So once I build this up, obviously I can keep doing the state splitting as far as I want. Once I stop, what I do is I go in and just take a uniformly distributed random number between zero and epsilon, where epsilon is as small as you want, and tweak all the transition probabilities so that the now these, what were predictively equivalent states, they're all in, in distribution, they have slightly different future morphs, and they're distinct. So these are all causal states. Now, because the transition probabilities are close to uh, a half everywhere, uh, we, the, the, the state probabilities are basically uniform, so the statistical complexity is when you log of the number of states, or eight in this case, or three bits, or again, it could be 16, 128, whatever. However, you can show that 
the past and future are very closely independent. And that's the criteria for the excess entropy being zero. So it's really, 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 really close to a fair coin, except for the small little variation in the transition probabilities, the future morphs as, as you hop around from state to state to state. And it, obviously, and, th and this, is, this, is, this is a construction scheme for a whole class of processes that have arbitrarily small past-future mutual information with arbitrarily large state information. So whatever these things are measuring, they're different. So, after all this discussion, there's sort of one, or several consequences to draw out. One is the excess entropy is not the process of stored information. Now, why do I point this out? Is that this has been a confusion. In fact, it still is a confusion in many literatures in information theory and in machine learning and neuroscience. Just by that one class of processes, the almost IED processes, shows that this is the case. There are other more, maybe, principled reasons for this, but at least there's an infinite class of examples. It really is the statistical complexity that's the stored information. But again, at this point, it's a little more intuitive because we know that they are built out of the causal covalence relations that are grouping things that are equally predictive. So how, how we, how, <laughs> so, we, so part of what the problem has been has been a poverty of language. How, how are we gonna think about these things? So, so what one sort of approach to this to think about E is the apparent information, right, in the measurement sequences. It's not, doesn't refer to directly how the, how many states, effective states there are, or um, the organization of the internal process. It's just kind of superficial, apparent. But sort of my, my favorite summary is the following. So, so CMU is the amount of information the process uses to communicate, it's a mechanism, like a channel, to communicate E bits of information from the past to the future. Right, we have this kind of superficial, oh, how is this sequence past related to this sequence? That's E. But now, we're looking at some, some box, right? There's some internal mechanism that's doing it, actually implementing it. And that's where the CMU comes in. And that can be very, very large, even if this appears to be close to a good random number generator. So, I mean, we probably have to come to your own terms with this, but these things are different, and there's a little bit of a collapse of terminology here when we get confused, right? So, so, so think of this as the stored information, and this is sort of kind of the superficial thing that we see. Now, of course, the puzzle is, when we're modeling these processes, what we started with even to get the causal states, we just worked with what we observed, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, there'll be cases where we assume we have a model and calculate properties of it, but we, we, we got the causal states from looking at the superficial thing. Just, so it's kind of, in some ways, a companion of E. So another way to think about this, this bound, the fact that these, these can be different, it's, it's really why we build models of the world. If somehow, Maybe it's hard now to believe it. Imagine that, that the state information and the observed mutual information were the same thing. In other words, the state information was always present in the observed sequences. Well, then what's a modeling strategy? You just store all your sequences. That's, a, that's as good a model, right? But the fact that, you know, well, and there are cases, right? So the periodic process, I would just write down the template word, one, zero, one, one, whatever it is, and then be done with it, right? So, so, but there are other cases where this is a really subtle process that, that is quite different, you know. Uh, so one way to think about the, some misinterpretations in the literature, really what they're doing is they're using observed sequences as proxies for states. And what we're saying is sequences aren't states. Sometimes we group them together because they're equally predictive. So we're breaking this kind of naive assumption. Um, and the other thing is, just, of course, there's internal structure process that's so not directly expressed by the observed sequences. And just to drive home this point, there is really this extremely widespread misconception about the past-future mutual information. It's just, um, it's amazing to read. It's often called the predictive information, which is a terrible name. It's actually misleading. Really, the predictive information is the statistical complexity. 
right? Statistical complexity is the stored information. It's the information you need to optimally predict. We proved that on Thursday. You can't use less information from the past than that. Right? That to, to try to help bridge this uh, terminological gap here, what I would suggest is the excess entropy is the predictable information. It's the information between the past and the future that can be predicted. It's not the information that you need to do prediction. So, <laughs> but I can give you 30 papers that confuse this in the last half dozen years. It's amazing. But, I mean, one of the lessons here is the methodological. You be really careful about the language you use to describe the mathematics that you're doing and the quantities you're talking about, especially in information theory. Something about information theory, it's very attractive, obviously, I'm a fan, but there's something about it that we all get kind of weak in the knees and use these sloppy phrases. Yeah. So, um, this is what I did, is back to your example of large CMU, small E, yes. you need a lot of information right. to predict something very small. You right. Don't, you don't, you're not, right. You can need essentially infinite information to predict a bit. Yeah, right. yeah. And you'd, yeah, absolutely, that, that could simply happen. And then you go, well, Jim, I really don't care about that bit if it's going to take me that much effort. That's a different question. That's fine. That's okay. We'll get to that. <laughs> we can talk about how we would trade off your prediction error against a model size. We can do that. And there's this thing called this rate distortion theory that does that. So, so, so hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. But yeah, right now, again, we're just talking, we're just trying to lay the foundations and then the practical issues and how we back off from that. So it's true. So you'd say for these almost ID processes, yeah, yeah, they're almost ID. So between you and me, you know, we're friends, it's ID. Well, there might be situations like reconstructing the text that you've transmitted. You really want, you can't just take E exactly to zero and make it a fair coin because then you're throwing a bit, you know, the essential bit away that you need. So, I really what this is telling you is that the state information, when E is very close to zero for the almost IAD process, so what's happening is there's something about how the state information is being measured, how you've labeled the edges. In that translation, this function from state paths to observed sequences, it's taking the eternal state information and spreading it out over arbitrarily long words. So that's what's going on. So the flip side of that is, well, okay, I only want to describe the statistics up to length 16 words, and then maybe it's essentially a fair coin. Well, okay, but that's, that's an issue of approximation. Um, oh, let's see, okay, this is just almost an anticlimax, but, but another kind of uh, bound. Um, if you remember, we have this sort of redundancy per symbol. Uh, we had a whole, whole set of different redundancies back when we were first introducing excess entropy. Sort of a first term of the excess entropy is uh, actually often used. It's the difference between the symbol, single symbol uncertainty, you know, the bias in the coin, if you will, and the actual entropy rate. This is the compressibility of, 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 of a process. So you can, in almost a, a very similar proof, tech, proof method, uh, uh, you can show that the statistical complexity is an upper bound on that, too. It's the same method. We write out this quantity here, the redundancy for length one symbols. Well, we actually just write in the definition for h mu. That's the uncertainty in the next symbol given the past. Um, and I can then, of course, replace past with causal states. I package it back up again as a mutual information between the causal states and the next symbol. Um, and then just invoke the fact that the mutual information is always bounded above by the entropy of either variable independently. So it's bounded above by CMU. It's very similar to the previous E proof. But again, this, this is a quick and dirty thing that you often find used to measure um, how, quote, complex processes are um, uh, used a lot in statistical mechanics, actually. So it's also upper bounded by this and different. So while the previous discussion holds. Okay, so, so what we've been doing is just uh, sort of compare and contrast. We had these information measures, entropy rate. Um, we could also talk about transient information, but we mostly just here uh, just, just talked about excess entropy and how that relates to this more structural view of the epsilon machine and statistical complexity. So these are different quantities, um, E and C mu. Um, now to 
try to get more at how uh, this issue of organization. <laughs> what is this? I mean, it's almost easier to talk about amounts of things, quantities, and argue them through. You know, C mu is an upper bound on E. Um, it's a more subtle question, almost philosophical, as to what we mean by something is structured. It has a pattern, it has a symmetry, and so on. So what I want to do here is kind of draw uh, kind of a contrast with, with uh, group theory, what we mean by um, symmetries that, that are expressed in terms of groups, and then talk about how um, the epsilon machine presentation is a type of group. It's a relaxation of the group concept. So just very quickly, this is a little bit kind of a high level, but so in, in when we talk about symmetries, we mathematically express that as, as what's called a group. Um, the idea here is that the sort of the, the organization of an object is defined in a complementary way by the list of all the operations you can apply to it such that it comes back to itself. So if I have a square and I rotate it 90 degrees, it's a square again. If I rotate another 90 degrees and so on, so I can make this list rotate by 90, 90, 90, and it's always the same thing. It's like there's an invariance. I apply an operation, I transform the object, and then when it comes back to itself, I note down, oh, this operation led to this object coming back to itself. So, so this is interesting kind of duality between the list of symmetry operations, the so-called group operations, and what the shape is. So we don't actually at some point ever define what the hell the word means, shape. We just say, oh, it's this list of operations. That's what we meant by shape. Okay. Now, in groups, the actions that you take always have to have inverses. If I rotate my square 90 degrees and I get a square, and if I rotate it back 90 degrees, I still get a square. Okay. So that's an important distinguishing property of, of, a, of a group. Now, by way of contrast, and I'll give two examples that show these. The epsilon machine is called a monoid. It's actually a semigroup with an identity. So let me define these terms. So the simplest description of a semigroup, it's, it's a relaxed group. So basically, it's a set of operations that don't have a unique inverse. I mean, it might be a little hard to think about if I had a square, at least the, 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 I rotate it 90 degrees, I rotate it back, it's still a square. And it's kind of hard to imagine if I did the opposite minus 90 degree rotation, it became something else. But we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll do this with time series. So, now there'll be certain processes for which the epsilon machine semigroup or monoid is in fact a group. And then it describes an exact symmetry. Um, but the point here is that semigroups are very important. Uh, they, in some sense, describe generalized or noisy or wild card symmetries or regularities. Not exact um, symmetries. So, so two examples to kind of contrast this. So here we've got one zero, one zero, one zero. So we have this period two process. Okay. And my operation is going to be translate by one time step. Okay comes back, now I have you know, a zero over here and a one here. Well, it doesn't match, but if I shift it again in time, the sequence comes back to itself. So shift in time by two is a group operation that describes this period two sequence. Okay, so we can translate it in time and we get the same sequence. And of course, it's easy to now talk about what the epsilon machine is because we're back in terms of talking about sequences, right? We would have two causal states, both predictable transitions, that produce the sequence. And then what, what the epsilon machine captures is uh, the, the pattern of the sequence is the periodicity in the st state sequence, A, B, A, B, A, B. Okay, so that's the case of when a time series has a group structure to it. There's just one operation shift by two steps. So now imagine we have a random process, some kind of random process here that's actually uh, described by this epsilon machine. Okay, so this is actually the noisy period two process. Um, there's actually a fixed zero and then I have a wild card, zero one, fixed zero, wild card, right? Now the pattern that's captured in this is actually the same as before, right? The internal state process is periodic. 
even though the actual object is noisy. So we sort of figured out the, a hidden symmetry by ex reconstructing the epsilon machine, the noisy period two machine, from this random process. So that's the sense in which there's an internal group structure, but that means that this object up here, this process up here, is a semi described by a semigroup, namely the full epsilon machine, right? So, so the point here, the contrast with the previous exactly periodic sequence here, if we translate by two steps, we don't get the same sequence back, we get the same distribution over the sequences back. And that's why it's a semigroup. So that's why I mean kind of noisy regularities, noisy symmetries. Yeah? So what, what properties of a group does a monoid have? Is it, is it uh, just sort of... The operation of concatenation or, or serial application of these uh, operations. Mm -hmm. um, the epsilon machine, there are different ways to sort of express it. Um, probably the, the Maybe the most obvious one, the, the, the group elements to take, or I should say the, the, the semi-group elements to take are the matrices, the symbol labeled transition matrices. So when you write out a word, there'll be some product. I take the zero matrix, the one matrix, the zero, zero matrix, and so on. And then what you have is, and then you can sort of track which semi-group element you're at by the actual entries in the matrix of the product. Yeah, and then, and then, then I can go from one matrix to another matrix on the zero matrix, and I get the new element, which is a product of things, so. So, so order and identity. Yes, yeah, yeah, but not unique inverse, right? So here, not unique over the transitions in, in the se sequence itself. So, yeah. Um, now, okay, so this is <laughs> maybe a more subtle point, maybe more important. Those previous two examples were easy to kind of compare, and I'm obviously not doing a real, real justice to group theory or semi-group theory at all, but there are other things the epsilon machines capture in their shape. We have the set of states and the transition structure. And I've been using English to describe these to you. Why? Because I hope you understand them. But in fact, that, that language fails us, especially if I had a 17-state machine. I'm not going to have some, oh, it's noisy period two, or it's the, uh, you know, in this case, the golden mean, no consecutive zeros. I mean, I keep using these examples because I can say in one English phrase, and you know what I'm talking about, right? No consecutive zeros. But what happens if I have some seventh state thing? Well, language just typically isn't there. In fact, you'll probably notice as we go along, we just concoct all these wild names, the butterfly process, the you know, random mana XOR process, all this just for some sort of labeling. But that doesn't mean that they're not structured. It doesn't mean that they're not patterned. In fact, it's the, it's the structure of the machine, that, the epsilon machine that, 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 that gives us that. Right? So, so again, even process, I use the word even. The pattern it's capturing is even. So the homework assigned today is uh, two sets of word distributions, and you're supposed to go reconstruct the epsilon machine and figure out, based on this, I want you to discover something. Keep playing, discover the patterns. Well, you have to come up with a narrative. After you get the machine, the states, and the transition start, you have to figure out what the narrative description of the property is it captures, what the pattern is. Just to kind of make this point, I mean, it's, 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 I, I always, it frustrates me, or I like giving this talk about the pattern because it's, you're sort of stuck using language. <laughs> and it, the idea really sort of transcends that. It's really is mostly kind of a, a mathematical concept of the algebra of a semigroup, so. Right, so. Okay, so um, I think we'll just finish up on this, which is another aspect of capturing pattern. Um, what I call measurement semantics. And this is again, it's going to just, if we're trying to exercise uh, this, the use of these epsilon machines in causal states. So, so measurement semantics is meant to answer a question. Namely, we've been sort of thinking about, you know, the, the, the hidden nature out here observed through some instrument producing a bunch of data, and we build a model out of the statistics and word distribution. But now I want to go back and you imagine that you have a particular model and then you've been watching the process for a while. Maybe you're even synchronized to the process. You know what state it's in. And at some particular time, you see a particular measurement value. And the question is, what's it mean to you? You know, you're a house fly flying around. You fly over you know, the Oxford English Dictionary, and there's a little thing, a little serif from a T or something like that. What's it mean to you? Well, in that case, probably nothing. But can we make, can we make that more intuitive? 
Well, there's sort of a, there's a contrast I want to draw to, to pull out this idea of measurement semantics. Um, the idea is that um, you're sort of looking at the world or that measurement sequence in sort of two different ways, at least two different ways. One is we call the prediction level, right? That's what, what, what does that one mean in terms of you're predicting the future? And that's really what Shannon was, was, was going for, right? And he gave us the semantics in the very first preface or chapter of his original papers. He, he said, oh, what you should think about the meaning is when you make that measurement, it's how surprised you are, right? So he came up with that so-called self-information, minus log of the probability, and sort of argued, again, that this is all very philosophical if you look back at it. You know, your, the amount of information in, in that symbol is minus log of the probability of, of observing that symbol. And he said you should think, oh, really what I mean is you're surprised. Get that? That's very subjective. Very effective theory, but very subjective. So, we have that answer in the Epsilon machine. You know, I'm, I'm the agent, I'm looking at the data coming in, I have my model, I've already done the modeling, I'm tracking it, going from state to state, state taking transitions. So, so what's, what's, how do we answer Shannon's question here? What's the amount of information in the next symbol? Well, that's just the log of, minus log of the probability of observing that symbol is minus log of the probability of going from my current state, seeing that symbol and going to a next state. This is a transition probability, log of a transition probability which of course if I average is the entropy rate, so no surprise, I'm just recasting familiar things here, right? So, so, so Shannon's looking at it sort of at this prediction level, he's just saying, how surprised are you? And that is captured in the epsilon machine by the transition structure. Okay. So if we had you know, time moving along here and we, some measurement sequence, we stop at time 11 and we see symbol one, how much information does it give? Shannon says, oh, that's something like this conditional entropy. My uncertainty in what I'm gonna observe at time 11, given the past going from time 10 on back. And that's you know, something like the entropy rate, and I would calculate about 0.6 bits there, because I know that was coming from a particular process. So it's just the degree of the uh, observer surprise, predictability. So, but this doesn't say what that particular occurrence, that S11 is equal to one, means to the observer. It's just, oh, I expected that. Oh, I'm surprised. So there's something else to do here besides just prediction. So the, 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 the notion of semantics or meaning I want to introduce is based on this idea that, that there's a, a tension between two different levels of representation of the same event. Okay, so level one, was sort of the, the previous context. It's just the data stream itself, and the event is just a measurement in the context of the process's pasts and their degrees of surprise, okay? But the other level is that, no, no, I'm an agent. I built the model. And when I make a measurement, that updates my expectations. What state it's in, what transition I should take, I up, it updates my model. So that's a different model relative notion. So, 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 and the claim is that sort of meaning occurs, there's a semantic content when there's a difference between these two levels. So in the case that I'm an agent with a model, the degree of meaning, I'll first talk about quantity, uh, I just call it sort of big theta here of S, is minus log of the probability of the state, causal state that you go to, having seen that measurement symbol S. So the prediction semantics was oh, uncertainty in which symbol I was going to see. And now what I'm saying is that the degree of meaning is log of the probability of the state I get taken to. Okay. And then the sort of content, rather than the amount, is the state itself. The state I get taken to is the meaning content. Again, language is sort of starting to fail us here, but... So we'll go through, go through some examples, right? Uh, but there's some boundary conditions that maybe also makes this definition sort of plausible. Um, well, so we have this epsilon machine. It has unique start state. What's the meaning of that start state? Well, we put all the probability up in that start state so that, uh, you know, minus log of that probability one is zero. 
So the amount of meaning is zero. Why? Well, what's the start state mean? We haven't made any measurements yet. Can't have any meaning. So that's good. <laughs> At least that's a little consistent with this. Um, what happens when we're reading a sequence and we're in some state and uh, we're in state B and we're going to see a one with probably when we go to state A, but in fact I'm in B and I see a zero. So what happens, what's the, the meaning of a measurement when it's a disallowed transition? Well, there's a little sort of process that we do here, which is what you do is your model's incorrect. You really don't know what's going on. The model said that's disallowed, so what you do is whatever picture you have of the process, like the distribution over states, you reset that so all the probability goes to the start state again. You really don't know, you're ignorant again, just like when you started out making the measurements. And then the idea is that these disallowed transitions are meaningless. Um, that doesn't mean that these sort of unanticipated disallowed transitions, when they're meaningless, it doesn't mean that you're not getting something from it. You're really, really, really surprised, right? Shannon says, since the transition probability is zero, that they're infinitely informative. This cannot happen. Then it happens, you go, whoa, right? Big surprise. So, so if the transition's disallowed, we have log of a uh, zero transition probability, which, which is infinite. So the surprise part of this is high, but it has no meaning to us, which is almost a nice way of defining what we meant by disallowed to start with. So at least there's kind of boundary conditions on this, you know, extreme cases of this proposed definition of meaning and meaning content, yeah. I'm just trying to relate this to maybe to the process of science. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you, I don't know, I'm not sure how long ago, but the, there was some something in CERN where they thought that they'd seen uh, neutrinos traveling faster than... Oh, the right, yes, right, yeah. Uh, so which would, of course, be a disallowed process according to their model, right? Right, so right. Disallowed event. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering... Like, they were really surprised. They were really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so Shannon would have <laughs> given them the right measure for their surprise, but then I guess the rest of the scientific community said, that's meaningless. <laughs> well, but then they, I thought they narrowed it down to some of those cables. Yeah, exactly. They finally figured it out. So it fell back into the regular context. They, re they resynchronized further down in their machine, right? Yeah, they figured it out, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they didn't reset all of physics to zero, the start state, right? They, they, they pondered, pondered, pondered. Although I, some of them probably felt that way. I mean, if it were true, then they really didn't know what was going on, so they would have to rebuild everything. But in fact, someone figured, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of, kind of a metaphorical description of it, but that's, that's the kind of basic idea. And it's, yeah, sort of curious. Quick observation, we're talking about log of the probability of the state you get taken to, and if I average that over time, I'm hopping in all the states, I'm visiting those states with an asymptotic, their asymptotic state probability, so the average degree of meaning is the statistical complexity. So this is so, so rather than me talking about the stored information, it's really the total semantic content of a process. That's what CMU is. Again, it's just a number, and you know, I'm not saying, you know, no consecutive zeros, that means kind of an interpretational thing, but, but there's a the number, so. So things kind of close up nicely here. Um, rather than just being Shannon and looking at the branching structure, we're also trying to figure out what, the, what these states mean and tell us. So let me not go through this in a lot of detail, but you can now apply this definition. It's like, um, so maybe you can kind of work through this offline, this table here. So here we've got some process described by this guy. Should look a little bit familiar. Uh, it's, if I see a one, I must see a one. Um, so it would be the even process, and I've even put in seeing a zero with probability zero, a disallowed transition. And you can just sort of go through here. So if I'm in state A, the start state, and I haven't made any measurements, well, there's no transition at this point. The, the degree of meaning is zero because I've made no measurements because all the probability is here. So that was the previous case I talked about. Um, if I'm in state A and then I see a one, well, I come back to myself. So with probability uh, two-thirds, um, or I go to state B with probability one-third, so that means these states ends up with probability two-thirds and probability one-third if I started here and saw one or saw a zero respectively, and therefore the, um, the sort of degree of meaning is just the log of those probabilities after one symbol. What's the meaning of that? Well, if I'm staying in A, staying in the start state, I'm still, I don't know what recurrent state I'm in. I'm unsynchronized, so that was the semantic content of staying here in the start state with a loop. To the extent I'm seeing ones, I'm unsynchronized. Whereas <clears throat> if I see a zero, I'm synchronized. 
So that's a little bit sort of what the semantic, the actual meaning is. Um, let's see, if I'm in state B and I see, uh, well, a zero or a one, both of those are equally likely. So there's one bit of surprise, says Shannon. Um, but the semantic content is that if I go on a one, I go to C, that means I've seen an odd number of ones. That would be the information content. If I go back to B, I've seen an even number of ones. Zero ones, two ones, four ones, right? So every time in here, it's a statement about the structure of the past that could bring me here. As long as I'm seeing ones, it means I've seen, as long as I've seen zeros, I stay here. I've either seen no ones or I've seen pairs of ones. So that's the structural interpretation of state B. And then, uh, right, so in state C, if I see a one, well, first of all, that's not even remotely surprising because that's, that's a given, I expect that. And I go to B, which means an even number of ones. Now, if I'm in C and I see a zero, well, that's disallowed. So I'm infinitely surprised. Uh, the semantic interpretations, I, I, I reset the machine and I lose synchronization. I go back to the start state. But it's meaningless to us. I don't know what to make of it. So you can even apply this definition of semantic content, like I just did, actually, to a sequence from the even process. But I actually was using the wrong model. You remember, you did this. It actually has four causal states, two transient and two recurrent. So you can go, th go through that table, which of course would be much longer, which is why I didn't do it. So I can even be looking at a day stream coming in with these rules and, and, and use a completely inappropriate model and I'll still have an interpretation. <laughs> I could look at the even sequence with the golden mean epsilon machine and go through this again. Maybe you're a little more challenged to come up with that one column that was like the semantic meaning of this, like you're misinterpreting things. Uh, if it's the wrong model, you, you'll, be, you'll be seeing lots of disallowed transitions, so you're resetting all the time, but you can still go through and calculate these numbers and think about what the meaning of each individual measurement is, even if it's the incorrect model, so. Yeah. Uh, can you have a epsilon machine where um, all the outputs from a given state go to one, only one state? Like the noisy period two? Yeah, noisy period two. Zero, and then I had both zero and one back to right. A. Yeah, right. Yeah, so wouldn't that be an example where it's like a bunch of surprise in the, in the observed symbol, but like zero surprise, like zero meaning? Yeah, right. So, right. so there you're going from A to B, A to B, so the internal state sequence is periodic. So that, that's just, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's even, even, odd, even an odd phase in terms of the semantic content. But then for one of the zeros, it's completely predictable. And for the, uh, at even times and then at odd times, it, you'll have a fair coin flip. And you'll be surprised. Yeah, so you can go through, I mean, these different, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, just pick some examples and apply these, these rules to it. Works out just fine. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I read, okay, I try, well, <laughs> I did slip something by in this. Sort of along the lines of what I was saying before. Language sort of fails us here. Um, I really, the things that probably made the most sense is when we had an, I was associating a number with the degree of meaning and contrasting that to the to Shannon's surprise interpretation of a measurement. Um, you know, and, and we're looking at amounts of memory and structure and surprise. But I, there was one column in the table where I tried to suggest what the meaning content was. And it's just, again, that's human language. In fact, it was English in particular. Um, that's really not... Language lets me point at what the meaning is. The actual meaning, turns out, has to do with the, the, the semi-group structure, the algebra of the epsilon machine that's entailed. How it sort of breaks up the sets of pasts and futures. So there's an, actually an algebra behind this that is really as close to the, more what I mean by meaning, the semantic content. Somewhat interestingly, this notion of, of uh, semantics goes back to kind of the early days in neuroscience. It's back in the good old days when um, there was less distance between computer science, information science, com um, people working on neural systems and so on. And the idea, an early reference is this Donald Mackay, famous neurophysiologist back then. He was trying to think about this stuff up here, neural tissue. And his idea was that meaning 
is the selection of some anticipated contexts. I have a, a palette of things and one thing gets selected. The thing that gets selected is the meaning I described. You said Chicago to the online uh, reservation system. So here, exactly, it's exactly this, right? The Epsilon machine gives the natural set of contexts the states. The causal states are contexts of interpreting the measurements. That they're what you're anticipating, right? Because each state is an anticipation. Namely, it makes some statement about the future, what futures can occur, the future morph. So they're contexts of interpretation. Exactly. So, so this is, I mean, the, the, uh, Mackay's discussion of this was very narrative. So this is actually giving a mathematical foundation to this notion of an intrinsic semantics to a source. So. Well, and there's still a lot more to do with this. I mean, you can imagine moving through the world and if you had some modeling system that was adaptively changing, you were learning new things, then of course your semantic view of the world would be enriched and you'd have new meanings appearing. So we'll come back and talk about an extreme case where it's not that the model states, um, causal states get more enriched, but in fact um, they diverge and you have to come up with a whole new class of models. And you can do that from the process itself too. So you go from basically incorrect hypotheses, it's a finite state source, to realizing it's an infinite state source and you end up with a whole new presentation, representation of the process. So that's a sort of huge semantic shift that is an example of you know, generally creating new meaning. So that's uh, the story for today. And we're going to kind of continue on Thursday with a similar kind of, you know, trying to exercise what these epsilon machines mean, uh, what the, what the, how we can use them, uh, what properties do they capture, and we're also going to talk about projects. So, be thinking a little bit about projects, and I'll go through some past projects and um, um, try to give some guidance. So, part of the homework is writing a project proposal. <laughs>